Szeretettel köszöntöm az egybegyűlteket a ma esti igazán egyedi alkalommal Szegedi Moszák Marian könyv bemutatóját. That's all I will say in the A warm welcome to you all on this very special occasion of the book reading by the accomplished author Marian Szegedi Moszák. It is particularly fitting that we greet her here since her uncle, Ferenc Gordian, was an original founder of the Hungarian House and its greatest benefactor of all time. He was the inspiration in the 1960s beyond, behind creating the Istán Széchenyi Society, uh, one of the co-owner organizations of this house. Many other family members were decades-long uh, leaders of another co-owner, the American Hungarian Library and Historical Society, which I'm the president of, including Gabriela Bautner, <coughs> the legendary, much beloved Mami Nani, and a daughter of Ferenc Korin, Erzsébet Mandi, who sadly passed away just a few weeks ago. We recall with the greatest love and honor with the greatest gratitude the generosity and vision of this remarkable family and its contribution to Hungary, to the world Hungarian community, and to the Hungarian American institution we call home in New York City. Marian is rightly fortunate to be the talented and proud transmitter of this historical family legacy. And we thank you for your presence here this evening. In terms of shared history, let me recognize the eldest among us, the last living co-founder of the Hungarian House and leader for 55 years of the library, my 96-year-old father, Dr. Otto Hamos, and my Introduce Alan Timberlake, director of the Columbia University East Central European Center of the Harriman Institute. Tonight is the second event of a promising joint series in collaboration with Columbia University, which began with the well attended book reading last month at Columbia by the writer Laszlo Krasnavorka. Please be on the lookout. Uh, as the series will continue this summer with a joint festival, film festival of Hungarian films to be shown at both venues, both here at the Hungarian House and uh, Columbia University. Uh, not simultaneously, but uh, at different time periods. Unfortunately, our tried and true partner, Ambassador Karla Dan, Consul General of Hungary, cannot be with us uh, this evening, but I do wish to recognize, and I think he's here, uh, and greet Gergely Romcic. Is he here? He's, he's typically very furtively on his way here. <laughs> he's the new director of the Balashi Institute, Hungarian Cultural Center in New York. Both of these government institutions are important partners of the Hungarian Library, and we appreciate their good work for mutual benefit. I also would like to greet at this time uh, Victor Fischer, a leader of the Janusz Janetta Foundation, which is part of the Hungarian Staff Association, also a support co-owner of the Hungarian House. As a penultimate moment, I would like to recognize the library's young, enthusiastic intern from Hungary, Zsuzsanna Beka, who will be with us until the end of September. Program of the Hungarian government. As she is tonight's real event coordinator, I think we would be appropriate to welcome her with a show of generous contributions uh, as you leave to support, in case you forgot to pay on the way and you can, you can amend your ways by paying on the way out, to support her and the library's good work. I'd like to say a word about the order for this evening or the the schedule. Uh, first uh, will be a reading by Marian Segedi Mossack, punctuated by a, apparently some PowerPoint slides. Then we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, the microphones will be available unless somebody wishes to write their 
question on a piece of paper, this is fine. Whatever paper you happen to have sat on is fine for that purpose. So whatever, whatever suits you the best. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a book signing and a wine and cheese reception uh, where, as I mentioned, anybody who feels they forgot to pay on the way in, they can always remember their ways on the way out. And uh, I just want to caution everybody that uh, Marion has a train to catch to go back to Washington at 9 p.m.? No, 10. So I have plenty of time. 10. Okay. Uh, okay. In closing, there's so much to say <laughs> about Marion. I could be here all night describing the memorable personal meetings I had with her parents and others depicted in her fascinating book, and the psychic moments of serendipity where our uh, paths have crossed. Of her many achievements, though, I would be remiss not to mention the newest event. Marian's book, I Kiss Your Hands Many Times, was published in Hungarian translation and just climb to the bestseller list in Budapest. Without robbing time further from our illustrious author, please give a warm welcome to Maria Sekedi Masa. Chancellor, thank you so very, very much. El Shem Tujo keeps a name for me and and that's it for me with Hungarian this evening. But I would like to thank all of you for coming here this evening, and I would certainly like to thank Alan and the Harriman Institute, the Consul, Hungarian Consul, Laszlo, Emesh, and Zsuzsana, and all of you um, at the Hungarian uh, Historical Society and the library here in New York. It really is quite a thrill for me to be here of all places, especially given the deep family connection I have. So I'd like to just begin by saying that my book is something that I think that emerged from something we all have in common. In fact, it emerges from two things we all have in common. The first is that as I look around this room here tonight, I can see hundreds and hundreds of stories, stories of families, of great personalities, of pathos, of wonderful happenstances, of tragedies, of historical moment. And I am no exception, as I will share with you a bit this evening. The second thing is, and I think this is also something we all share, it's a kind of a curiosity about our parents. Not in so far as who they were as we knew them when we were growing up, as they had been changed by us and by time, but to try to imagine what they were like in real time, what their voices were like before they were changed by time and us, and how they talked to each other. And I was fortunate enough to be able to discover that as well. I'm a journalist, and I am a daughter. And as a journalist, I always knew I had a great story. And as a daughter, I always knew that I wanted to tell it but wasn't sure how. To give you a very short version of why it's a great story, and so many of you know it, but um, let me reiterate it. My mother's family, the Kornfelds, and the descendants of Manfred Kreitz, were the largest Jewish industrialists in Hungary and they survived by making a deal with Heinrich Himmler. My father was a Christian, and he was in the foreign ministry, he was a diplomat. He was the head of the political division of the foreign ministry, and he tried to negotiate a separate peace with the Allies. And for that effort, he ended up going to Dachau. My parents met and fell in love in 1940, but they couldn't get married because of the Jewish laws. So they had to wait and wait until my father was liberated from concentration camp. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. As I said, my mother's family were, was the great Manfred Weiss family. Now I know many of you know who they are, but for the few of you who don't, Manfred Weiss was the man who could be considered responsible for industrializing a fair bit of Hungary. 
There he is in the middle, surrounded by his six children and his wife, Alice Duval. And he began his, this is a Jewish family, a highly assimilated Hungarian Jewish family. And that's a very important point to make and something that we'll talk about a little bit later. He began with his factory on an island called Chepel, which as you know is in the middle of the Danube, near Budapest. And this factory began actually in Budapest um, and was a canning factory. It started manufacturing uh, conserves and then they put goulash in it. And eventually he ended up with a contract with the military because the shape of cans can be very flexible. So not only can they be the size of the tin cans in our uh, supermarkets, but they can also be reduced to the size of bullets. And so he began to manufacture bullets for the Hungarian army, the Austro-Hungarian army. And that is not a very good idea to have a bullet factory with gunpowder downtown in the, this, not quite the center, but in the city. So after an unfortunate explosion, he moved out to Cheko. At one point, this factory employed 20,000 people and was manufactured everything from safety pins, very bad automobiles, bicycles, pots and pans, Messerschmitt engines for the Germans. That's a little bit complicated. And as you can imagine, later on, it got especially complicated. He had six children, as I said. My mother was one of his grandchildren. My grandmother, who is the beautiful woman back there, Marion, um, was his uh, second daughter and really a beloved daughter. He was widowed with these children. His wife died at 37 of pernicious anemia. And so they lived lives of enormous grace and splendor. My mother is the little girl to your right. My aunt is the little girl to the left. My grandfather is the anti-social man reading the newspaper in front. <laughs> With the marriages of, the, of five of these children, Edith, who is back there, sort of hidden, uh, never got married, but all of the other ones did get married. And at a certain point, with all of these marriages, this family and the extended family was responsible for 10% of the Hungarian GDP. So it was enormously powerful. One, now we can move to my father. I will, you can figure out which one he is. Um, he was born to a very upper middle class, very Hungarian family. His father was the highest civil servant in the Habsburg court. And as you can imagine, after World War II, his personal fortunes changed rather radically. My father always wanted to be a diplomat and went to Ecole de Sciences Politique. And his first posting after that was in Berlin in 1932. My father was born in 1903, so even by modern standards, he was a bit old by the time I was born. And he went to Berlin in 1932 as the secretary to the Hungarian ambassador there. And there he witnessed firsthand the rise of Hitler and the demonic presence of this man. He could see how devastating Hitler would be for the Jews in particular. Nobody could have imagined how devastating, but Jewish businessmen, Jewish actors, people, um, Hungarian Jews who owned various um, enterprises in Berlin, as soon as Hitler began, immediately began to flood the Hungarian consulate there, begging for some help because they were, their businesses were being taken away, their properties were being taken away. And they were told that if they tried to fight this, they would be accused of some crime in jail. This was very early on, and it made my father convinced anti-Nazi. My mother, and, who was far right, and her brothers and sisters grew up as initially as Jews, but they converted. And here is a little bit of Hungarian history, which I look around the room and I probably don't have to tell any of you any of this, but bear with me. In 19, as you know, can we change the um, As you know, Hungary used to be very, very large. As part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Hungary was 
included, and there were many Hungarians, in all of the countries surrounding um, the, or as part of the empire. After World War I, the devastating Treaty of Trianon robbed Hungary of two-thirds of its country and one-half of its population. This created a trauma. It was unfair, but no one doubts this anymore, and it's a kind of a problem that we know lingers even today. On the other hand, it also created tremendous instability in the country. Béla Kuhn became the president of Hungary, and he was a communist. He also was, if not by religious conviction, at least by birth, Jewish. And this, and he was, his reign only lasted 133 days, but this was sufficient combined with one of the other effects of Trianon, and a very important effect, that in all of those surrounding regions were many, many national minorities. After Hungary was eviscerated, there was one large national minority, and they were the Jews. So if you combined this combination of both Bela Kuhn's presence and catastrophic realm, and the loss of these territories, Hungarian anti-Semitism gained great flower. And there became linked in many Hungarian minds a kind of an equation between communism and Judaism. Paradoxically, there was also linked in many Hungarian minds the combination of too much power for the Jews and not enough power for, for real Hungarians. So, for example, in Hungary was the first anti-Semitic law in 20th century Europe, the numerous clauses law. What this meant was that, as you know, the number of Hungar the number of Jews in the professions, in universities, as lawyers and doctors, had to directly reflect the number of Jews in society. So if there's six percent of Jews in society, there could only be 6% of Jews in universities and businesses and the legal profession. For many members of the Hungarian Jewish aristocracy, this meant a real tension in their minds by trying as to whether they could remain Jews and still be considered to be good Hungarians. Miklos Horty marched in. He was an admiral, as you know curious situation for a country that is as landlocked as Hungary, but of course during the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Hungary was not landlocked. And Horty himself began um, and supported a number of this, these anti-Semitic laws and a kind of a spirit of anti-Semitism that did prevail. Here he is meeting my great-grandfather, Manfred Weiss, and there's a curious picture of the Madonna in the corner. And I've shown this picture to a number of people, and then maybe there is somebody here, actually, who might be able to, um, to um, pull it apart for me. But I'm not sure exactly where it was taken. But Horty was very clear that he did um, appreciate Jewish enterprise and the Jewish businessmen who kept the country going. My mother's family would spend many, most of the year in Budapest, but then they would also spend the summers in a place, a uh, country house called Irai, which was, again, a place of such refined civility that many people were brought there as a kind of a showcase for a, for a model farm. And my mother and father would correspond, and I'm going to tell you about that later. Here was part of the fine life that my mother's family experienced during an interwar period when, frankly, many people did not have it so easy in Hungary, and especially not in Budapest. My mother's, my mother's family in the 20s began to convert, but my grandmother was very reluctant to. Not necessarily because she was such a pious Jew. The children of Manfred Weiss celebrated Christmas, they ate ham, they did not keep Sabbath. 
But nonetheless, there was this sense of identity. And for my grandmother, the idea of not being able to be buried in the same cemetery as her parents was very, very painful. And she resisted. On the other hand, my grandfather, Lawrence Kornfeld, was a believer. He believed in Christianity. His sister became a lay nun and translated um, St. Augustine into Hungarian. This was not a conversion that was just a kind of expedient, politically correct thing to do. This was something that emerged from religious faith. One that my grandmother did not particularly share, but one day she was with, the cut with her children, my mother and her sister and two brothers, on a vacation in Italy. And my grandfather was supposed to arrive and didn't come, didn't come. And she made the first of what were many bargains with God and said that if he arrived safely, she would convert to Catholicism. He did, she did, and they did. And so the family, my mother's sense of herself was very much as a Catholic. On the other hand, she had many cousins. They too were baptized, some of them Protestants, some of them Catholics. But they socialized very much among themselves. The family was considered to be a coral reef. They lived on top of each other so much. My father returned to Hungary in 1938. And then he began his career in the foreign ministry. He was a convinced anti-Nazi. On the other hand, he was also in the foreign ministry of a German ally. Hungary had a very curious relationship with its German, um, out with, well, with Germany. Certainly, there was a very anti-Semitic streak in Hungary. Certainly, Hungarians much preferred the idea of Germany as an ally than Russia as allies. That was never a comfortable possibility at all for Hungarians. And the alliance continued, you know, with relatively um, a relative lack of terrible anti-Semitic legislation, terrible anti-Semitic. There were no cons there were no cons deportations until much later. There were Jewish labor battalions where young Jewish men were recruited basically as cannon fodder and sent out. But there wasn't this, there was always a kind of an interesting balancing act that the Hungarian government attempted to maintain. My father, on March 19th, 1944, as we all know, 70 years ago this year, the Germans became impatient with their Hungarian allies and they invaded. There were a couple of reasons for this. One of them was that Hitler could not stand the idea of an intact Jewish community still in Europe. Another reason was that Hitler could not stand the kind of prevarications of Region 40 and the Hungarian government. A third reason was that he had caught wind of something that my father had been very, very involved with, and that was negotiating a separate peace with the Allies as a way of extricating itself out of World War II and out of the German alliance. <clears throat> so the Nazis invaded, and my mother's family, excuse me, sorry. My mother's family, obviously, were still considered to be Jews. They all hid. My grandfather and Ferenc Koren, best friends, went to an abbey in Zierz, near Lake Bolaton, and were apprehended within, 24, within 48 hours. My father roamed the streets of Budapest. He knew he was going to be arrested. He couldn't bear the idea of trying to hide, because he also knew and had heard stories of individuals who had hid, and then their families were taken as hostages. He was the sole support, really, of his parents and two sisters, and he wanted to make sure that they would be protected, even given the fact that he was eventually arrested in April. This is my mother's yellow star, which I found in the bottom of an old bag that she had tucked away in, the family, in, in our family home in Washington, D.C. Jews only had to wear the yellow star after, August, after April 4th, 1944, 
And then the massive deportation of Hungarian Jewry from the countryside was taking place with Adolf Eichmann. Meanwhile, my mother's family was hiding in various places. My grandfather was interrogated and went to Mauthausen. My father was kept in the Fowitza prison until November of 1944, when he was transported to Dachau. As we know, Dachau was a political, mostly a, pr a prison camp for, uh, for political prisoners and for dregs of society. It was not, strictly speaking, an extermination camp, but it was still an awful place to be. As I said, my parents met and fell in love in 1944, but they couldn't get married because of the Jewish laws and because of my father's position in the foreign ministry. So they were separated. As I also said, my grandfather and Ferenc Korin were taken to prison camp. And this is Ferenc Korin, the great benefactor of Madar Haas and a lot of other places. And what was extraordinary is that he was taken out of prison camp. Colonel Kurt Becker, who my mother always said was a thief, but not a murderer, and one of Heinrich Himmler's closest adjutants, decided that he wanted to have a beachhead, an industrial beachhead in Hungary. Remember, 1944. D-Day was a few weeks away. He couldn't have exactly known that, but he certainly knew the end could have been near. The Russians were advancing from the east. And Becker, working closely with Himmler, thought that it might not be a bad idea to have a huge industrial base in Hungary before the great cataclysm of the Germans and the Russians meeting. So Becker was assigned to negotiate a deal, and the amazing thing was that he kept his side of the bargain. He negotiated a deal with my uncle uh, Frank Ferenc Corin, and for a 25-year lease of the factories, the coal mines, the properties, Becker was ensconced in Ferenc Korin's house on Andrashinitsa, and Korin was living in a basement apartment there while negotiating this deal. He had been tortured in prison camp and in prison, and he was a broken man, and when he arrived, um, and the deal had been finalized. The whole family, about 40 people, were pulled out from various hiding places and assembled in one of the Montfred, well, one of the mountain villas in the hills of Buddha. There they all saw each other for the first time in about 40 days. They were very relieved to see each other, and yet my aunt Daisy was reluctant to sign away things, not because she wanted to keep everything but she was worried because one of the elements of the deal was that there had to be four hostages remaining behind to ensure that there would be no word of this coming out. Because the Germans did not want the Hungarians to know about this any more than the Himmler wanted Goering to know about this. They were all competing for these properties. Finally, they were signing everything away. My aunt Elsa, who was one of Manfred Weiss's his oldest daughter, she was widowed at 34 with seven children, and a, the only spendthrift in the family. She loved spending money, unlike everybody else who was very, very thrifty. And she said, if I had known we had this much, I would have spent more. <laughs> and she probably should have. The family ended up getting passage to, Esch, to Portugal. And when they were arrived, they were immediately um, detained. And I'd like to read you a little bit about their arrival. Millionaire Corin buys Nazi freedom, read the bold headline in the Syracuse Herald American. Paul Golly, the correspondent in there, wrote, it was by selling to the Hermann Goering crowd all the shares of the Shalgo mines and the Montfred Weiss armament works that the Hungarian Jewish multimillionaire Ferenc Korin and his family were able to escape to Lisbon a few days ago. Golly reported that Korin planned to go to America, quote, convinced that there is nothing in this world that money cannot buy. Meanwhile, his fellow Jews in Hungary, not being millionaires, must continue to submit to Nazi tortures. Recent estimates speak of 300,000 Israelites as being earmarked for deportation. Reports reaching here indicate that 100,000 Hungarian Jews 
had been gassed in the Auschwitz camp. British and American intelligence services in Portugal assumed that the family must be German spies. The logic, tortured as it was, was that the deal implied that Germany had engaged in special negotiations, possibly peace talks, with the United States and the United Kingdom, and that one part of those discussions involved the protection of these Hungarian Jews. The Russians could not help but feel cut out of these arrangements, and their suspicion would corrode the alliance. I have a thick file of these reports from the OSS, the US State Department, the British Foreign Office, and the British Embassy in Portugal. Each one contains fragments of the truth. The communications finally reached Winston Churchill, who was being asked from all directions for permission to pursue the family. The Russians insisted that these rich German spies should at least be interrogated, if not apprehended. Finally, on the 8th of August, Churchill wrote in his special witness, quote, this seems to be a rather doubtful business. These unhappy families, mainly women and children, have purchased their lives for the food of nine-tenths of their life. I should not like England to seem to be wanting to hunt them down. By all means, tell the Russians anything that is necessary, but please do not let us prevent them from escaping. I cannot see how any suspicion of peace negotiations can be fixed on this miserable affair. In Portugal, the family also was with another famous Hungarian Jewish family, or at least some members of the Hungarian Jewish family. Yes, these are the Gabors. I was asked if I would have, Alan asked if I would say anything entertaining, so here goes. The Gabors, uh, Eva and Jaja, were already in the United States conquering society and the movies, but they left their mother and their older sister, Magda, and their father, who was an invisible figure, um, still in Budapest. Magda had a long affair with a Portuguese ambassador to Budapest, and he was recalled back to Lisbon after the Germans invaded. So he was feeling a little bit worried about his mistress and her family, so managed to get them out as a kind of piggyback to the deal that saved my family. And Jolie, the mother, the unbelievably ambitious mother, who always had an eye for the most powerful man in the room, had quite a flirtation with my uncle Ferenc Korin, and at one point she summoned him to her bedroom, uh, wearing, and said, you know, Ferry, I only have my oldest nightgown. And they used to, he was a little embarrassed by this, and they used to play gin rummy for money. So he said, why don't we play some rummy? And they played rummy for a little while. He lost, she won, he paid her, and she said, you know, Ferry, this is the least amount of money I have ever been paid by a man when I've been lying in bed. So there was the family story about the family and my family. Meanwhile, my father was in Dachau, and he got very, very ill there, and my mother had no idea what had happened to him. As I said, they met in 1940 at the friends and friends' houses, and gradually they fell in love. This was a relationship that was not possible. My husband, my husband's mother, Sigmund Freud would shudder. My father's uh, political position and my mother's religion made it really difficult for them to court in any kind of a normal way. Add to that the Jewish laws in which the Hungarians forbade the marriage between Jews and Gentiles, even the relationship between Jewish people and Gentile, or the romantic relationship. So they had to hide, and they traveled around, um, in this, they drove around to my father's car, Steyr 100, which we'll see a picture of soon, uh, into the hills of Budapest. And this was where they fell in love. And here is where I had the great, great opportunity as a daughter. Because my parents were very private people. They would not speak about their relationship. We lived with my grandparents and my mother's sister in a house in Washington, D.C. And I really knew very little, like a bit, as we all do, until everyone had died. And it fell to me, as the only daughter, to clean up the family house. And there, at my mother's bedside table, my father died in 1988, my mother died in 2002. And at my mother's bedside table, I found a cache of letters 
written by my father to my mother, but of course all in Hungarian. And there were in little envelopes marked 1940, 41, 42, and 43. And these letters chronicled a relationship I had no idea existed. He would describe going on their long drives. He drove to her when she was at the country place in Iraq in the summers. Her letters are lost. He probably had to burn them on March 19th when the, Ger when the Germans had invaded. I couldn't read the letters, obviously, as I have announced unhappily. I don't speak Hungarian, and I certainly don't read Hungarian. So a friend of mine translated them for me. But the way that we did it was not in a conventional way that I would give her the letters, and two weeks later a neat group of typewritten letters would be returned, but instead she would read them to me, and I would type them. So I could hear this letter and these relationships, their relationship unfold before me. And it was quite unlike any that I had imagined. My father was not the man I knew, but he did become a man that I would have liked to know. And as he was, in the last time they saw each other was on March 18, 1944, when they celebrated my father's mother's birthday. They separated, not knowing that they wouldn't see each other again for almost two years. Finally, as we all know, the Americans came and liberated Dachau. And my father was very ill. He was seen as being a very promising man for the Americans and for the Allies, because they saw in him a man who had been completely uncompromised by events in Hungary. Indeed, somebody who was very brave. For some inexplicable reason, they took him to Paris. And this was where he wrote my mother for the first time. My dear Hanchi, this is the first opportunity to write you to ask you, do you still love me and to tell you that I love you? In my case, there is no change and I wish that you would be my wife as soon as possible. That is unfortunately one thing that did change. I became a bit worn out physically and maybe even emotionally. I had typhus, myocarditis, prison diarrhea, and nephritis. I almost perished, but I had a Dutch medical doctor friend who saved me at the last minute. Now I am in general okay, but I still move around with difficulty and have to watch my heart. That is the physical part. The emotional one, of course I cannot judge myself, but sometimes I feel as if I have problems there too. I'm even more indecisive and helpless than before. Consequently, I feel that it is irresponsible to want to tie your fate to mine. Yet broken and without a job, I am asking you to be my wife. On the back and front of each page, and on the back of the fourth page, his writing was crawling up the margin. He wrote about the uncertainty of his situation. Several pages into the letter, he returned to the days after March 19th and asked her forgiveness for having been, quote, so cowardly that I walked out on you and I did not come to see you. I was in a horrible state of mind. I was watched and I expected to be arrested. This is, of course, not an excuse, only a mitigating circumstance, because nothing can excuse that I left you. But I've been punished a little, and maybe I can atone by never leaving you again, supposing, of course, you want this too. Think about this profoundly, my hunchy, because we will not have an easy life. I have no idea how my mother got the letter. I remember asking her once when she had heard from him, and she told me that he wrote from Paris somehow, I don't know. What an anodyne, passionless, boring thing to say, I thought. I figured she was talking about a telegram, Anne alive, stop, love all of them. <laughs> but even then, he wrote from Paris somehow, I don't know. How could she not know? She hadn't heard from this man for over a year. She hadn't known if the love of her life was dead or alive. Maybe the evening after I had asked her, she went upstairs and safe in their bedroom, away from her intrusive daughter, she pulled out the drawer of her bedside table and took out the letter to reread it. I will never know. But when she was dead, I found this letter in the drawer that contained the others. There was none, no envelope to reveal whether it had been mailed or hand-delivered by someone they both knew who had been going to Eshterill. Consequently, I feel that it is irresponsible to want to tie her fate to mine. Yet broken and without a job, I'm asking you to be my wife. Yes. The answer was yes. 
My father was not without a job for long. Here he is in his prison camp uniform. He was made then, and this is a fascinating little thing that I had to throw in. Because while the Dutch medical doctor in the Dachau certainly saved him physically, there was a French architect who saved him psychologically. His name was Faure, and I tried to track him down somehow, but failed. And when my father was very ill, Faure also was sick, but they were in beds next to each other in the infirmary in Dachau. And they would talk about each other, their lives, their children, their hopes for the future. And my father described how he wanted to have a country house in Hungary that he could share with my mother. And Foray began to sketch out the possibilities. And this was found after my book was written and published in the collection of my father's papers that had not yet been gone through. And here is a picture drawn in pencil in Gaha of a country house by a French architect who sort of saved my father and gave him something to hope for. My father was not without a job for long. The government, the fragile coalition government that was established in 1944, decided to make him the first Hungarian ambassador to the United States. He was a minister then, there wasn't a formal embassy. Because he was a man, they were all considered to be um, just the right person to represent Hungary and to hopefully create a new relationship between a former enemy, between two former enemies. My mother traveled across war-torn Europe in December of 1945. My father said that she had to see the country that she was going to represent. So to go from Lisbon to Budapest in 1945 December was no easy feat. As you know, the Germans blew up all the bridges um, as a parting shot. And the city was quite devastated after the worst siege in, well, in one of the greatest battles, and one of the most tragic battles of World War II. My mother traveled the last leg of her journey from Vienna to Budapest with the Hungarian war criminals. It was the last memorable flight that she took before being reunited with my father after uh, nearly two years of separation. They married on December 23rd, and shortly after Christmas came to the United States where she was Mrs. Ambassador, and he was the minister from Hungary. There she is in her, and she said that this was a picture that was both a wedding picture and would serve as the um, official portrait. And there's my father looking unbelievably young, as he was, 42 years old in 1945, and the weight of the world was already on his shoulders. I found these various clippings of my mother, these breathlessly, uh, breathless descriptions from the society pages of their time there. And indeed, they did seem to be quite a popular couple. One of the great coups of my father's tenure was to bring in representatives of the Hungarian government for a visit, and they actually met Harry Truman, which was quite a thing to do. I think all of you know who the evil communist is in that picture. Even if you didn't know him by sight, you could probably just look at him and know who he was. And here, um, President, my father is the man happy in the back, and it says, everybody is smiling. They did not smile for long, unfortunately. There was gradually what was called the salami tactics. And by 1947, things in Hungary, the government in Hungary, was gradually being taken over by the most brutal Stalinist members of the Hungarian government, as embodied by the man Matas Rakoshi, who is the guy in the corner on the right. My father was faced with a terrible decision. He heard, he heard the reports about the courts, about the dreaded secret police, the AVO, about the torture and apprehension of a number of leading Democrats. He heard about various civil institutions being taken over, and finally, the government asked for him to return to Hungary in June of 1947. My father realized he had only one chance, and there was an incredibly tiny window of opportunity, which was that the American ambassador to Hungary at the time was, being, was returning home 
So there was a period of time when the Americans had the option of perhaps not sending an ambassador to a government that could have been considered illegitimate. <laughs> My father went to the US State Department to meet with a couple of his former colleagues, or people who handled the situation from there. And he asked them if they would please not send an ambassador, if they would please wait and perhaps exert a little bit of pressure on this government so that maybe the Democrats in the government could reemerge and gain some strength. And at least it would be a gesture of some national disapproval. The Americans refused. And my father entered the State Department as the minister from Hungary, and he left as an exile. And he resigned. And that is really where my story ends. My father remained, my mother and father remained in Washington, D.C. They, my father tried to cobble together some kind of a living. He worked for, briefly, for Radio for Europe. When he discovered it was a CIA operation, he would quit immediately. His family, his mother and sisters and father, were still in Hungary. And the fates of these two families, of my mother's family and my father's family, also show the tremendous divergence in the fates of so many Hungarians. My mother's family were born under lucky stars. They all got out. Most of them got American visas. Those who didn't came, went to Switzerland. And they settled either here in New York or in Washington, as my grandparents did in Washington, D.C. with our family. Ferenc Korin, the benefactor here, who was an amazing man and the picture of resilience. He could have, he recovered from his imprisonment. And when he arrived here, as I, after he arrived here, I remember sitting in his daughter's apartment. They lived on 1000 Park Avenue. His daughter lived in 1155. And I was sitting in her apartment with her once. And I said, so how did you, you know, father manage after you arrived here? She said, well, you know, my father was very clever. He did some factoring for some textile companies in South America. He did a little bit of insurance. He did a little bit of pharmaceutical investment. He invested with Mr. Zeckendorf here in New York in real estate. But what he really changed everything was when he invested, provided venture capital for a company that went public. And what company was that, I asked? Gulf Western, she replied. So he and Charlie Bluehorn were two of the founders of Gulf Western, and obviously, Ferenc Korin, he said that if I had been born in this country, I would have been a Rockefeller. My father's family did not fare so well. I found a letter that he had written to one of his former associates in the U.S. State Department. Written in, he wrote it in 1949, and he said, my parents have been deported to the countryside. My father has lost his pension. My sister's sentence has been changed from death to life imprisonment. My cousin has been murdered by the secret police. Can you tell me to what extent I am responsible for any of this? And that was really what hung over my father as we all lived in this big house on Patterson Street in Washington, D.C. My grandparents lived with us and my mother's sister. And my father cobbled out his life as best as he could in the United States. He worked a little bit for the Library of Congress, pulling together their Hungarian section, and then finally got a job with the Voice of America, which he uh, stayed with until he retired the moment he could in 1968, and then he began to write his memoirs. He never managed to see the big change in this country, although he did, he was able to return home to visit his family. His first visit was in 1963, and I remember we took him to the airport on the day that President Kennedy's funeral took place. And there was this odd juxtaposition in my memory of his departure and that death. So that is really a quick trip through my book, and um, certainly there are many other details in it. But I would like to thank you all so very much for coming this evening. And I, if you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Thank you again.
the people of the country that I, that I, that I was born in, for example, in Turkey. So could you, could you say a few yes. words about your father as a man, as a father, well, you the know, child, the child? Uh, you no, know, it's a wonderful question because it is the, a little bit the way that I, um, you know, as I said, there is this curiosity really about our parents. And I was the youngest and uh, sort of a uh, late arrival. And at that point, I think everyone in the family had rather retreated into some pretty uh, predictable roles. So my mother's family dominated, and our nuclear family were sort of on the low end of civilization, these two, uh, three American children um, and my parents. And so I think that my father, now um, one would say that he was clinically depressed. He had been traumatized twice, once, of course, in Dachau, and the second time, really, by what happened, not just to him, but to his country. I mean, he was a great patriot. And so, in many ways, he was a very uh, formal man, and I think that my parents both figured out a way of carving out his own privacy that made a nuclear family a little bit more subordinate to the bigger family of my uh, grandmother's family. This was a situation that I think my father suffered through in ways that I had no idea until I looked at his, uh, some of his journals. But he was, he loved to garden and I remember once asking him if he did that in Hungary and he said, no, this was something that he did uh, only to go in the United States because he had seen so much destruction in his life that to watch things grow was especially gratifying. He was very learned. You could ask him anything, really. He seemed to know it and would take a long time describing it to you. But he was also, I think, um, I only realized later, but I think I had a sense of it. He, he suffered at an existential level of the choices he made and what he had experienced. So it was a little bit confusing, of course, as an American child. And I think the fact that they did not teach us Hungarian um, is interesting, especially given what a Hungarian patriot he was and how deeply Hungarian he was. So that gap always existed. And one that was bridged a bit in the process of, you know, actually really the privilege of working on my book and being able to invade their privacy as massively as I did. I've read the book and it's brilliant and in the same way that you know after the book was published you found the uh, the architectural drug. Is there a, another book in the works? Oh thank you no uh, not I'm about this. That as well. <laughs> thank you, not yet. And I think I have um, I have written the book about our family. Um, I but I certainly have love to write another book, but looking around for subjects. I mean, I'll, I'm a writer, I would love to write a book, but uh, this is it for the great family saga in my life. Yes, there was a question. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask you about your sense of identity. Um, you are from a, obviously a Jewish family, but you are not Jewish, or at least Jews considered you Jewish, I'm sure, uh, but you're not. Your family is Hungarian, but you don't speak Hungarian. <laughs> you were born in America. How do you feel? Who are you? That's such a great question. <laughs> it's, a, no, it's very astute because, of course, they are very parallel, these two situations of being Hungarian and not speaking Hungarian, and being Jewish but not being Jewish. And I, um, it's a, but it's also a very difficult question to answer because, in many ways, I, uh, I you know, we are who we are, and I'm a long girl. And in many ways, um, I suppose I have always looked with some envy at thoroughbreds and um, wondered what that would be like, but also feel very grateful to be a little marginal because, in many ways, it has made me a better journalist. And I couldn't have written <coughs> the book that I did, and I am proud of this book, if I were any one of those things completely. It was really being able to be in the interstices and being able to understand these complex identities 
that made it much easier for me to understand and write about complex situations without oversimplifying or without assuming really that there are easy answers and also assuming that what you see is really who people are. And um, that is a very important lesson in both journalism and in life. I would just like to put out um, a thought to you. I live part of the time in Budapest and part of the time here. And I know that uh, right now there's uh, what in Hungary uh, some are calling a whitewashing a bit of history. At the same time that, uh, around the Holocaust especially. Right. And at the same time, there's a little grassroots movement about uh, teaching the Holocaust uh, as part of the national curriculum. Uh, and I happen to know for a fact that the American Embassy is a little bit involved in that effort. And so what I want to put out to you is to perhaps uh, promote your book as being part of the uh, national curriculum and teaching on the Holocaust, because it's an important family history. And uh, even if they weren't Jews, the family, it's still an important part of the industrialization of Hungary and uh, all the rest of all the things that you spoke about. So my point is, if the chance or opportunity comes up for you to promote the book so that it's part of the national curriculum, I commend that you do. Uh, thank you. I would certainly never um, shy away from something like that. It's obviously not my decision, but but that whole question, you know, especially it's funny because I've spoken, of course, to so many American audiences, and that whole question of identity and of history is something that, as Hungarians, we understand how complex it is. But for Americans, this idea of a family, you know, I've been asked over and over again, but you're still Jewish, aren't you, or aren't you still, and, and that, to be able to say, you know, I have Hungarian friends whose grandmothers were lighting Shabbat candles in the apartment next door, and they didn't realize they were of Jewish origin until they were in their 20s. And so it's a, it's a very curious situation, and I think it's, it would be um, nice to have a broader conversation about that, especially now, you're right. I had a great fortune of knowing your father. Okay. I had a great good fortune to sitting next to your father at the Voice of America for a couple of years. My desk was right next to his. So I knew him as a man of integrity, of great intelligence. And I had so much respect for him. I'm very happy that you have written this book. My background is also very similar to have been born in a very assimilated Jewish family. And all I want to say that I'm always sad when we talk about the Hungarian Jews. I felt myself as a Jewish Hungarian. And I think the difference is very important. Thank you. And thank you very much for that. It's very true that distinction that was made often and is just part of the, of the national conversation. You're absolutely right, changing the language would be very important. It's just a tiny story, since Ferenc Korn was such an important person here. His daughter, Daisy, um, was seven years old in 1934 and was going to be going to um, a, school, regular school, Catholic school. And her mother, Corey Daisy, decided it would be a good idea to tell her a little bit about the facts of life and certainly about the facts of her Jewish origins. So she called her into her room and she said, you know, I just wanted to tell you that they're all good people. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or you're Catholic or you're Protestant. What is most important is that you have a spiritual life and that you are a good person. And she went on and on and gave quite an eloquent speech. And then she asked her daughter, do you understand what I said? And little Daisy said, I do. And she said, do you have any questions? And she said, yes, Mama, I do. And she said, well, what is it? She said, Mama, have you ever seen a Jew in your life? 
<laughs> now this is a seven-year-old girl talking to her mother, who, and this girl's grandfather was a rabbi. And how quickly, you know, these questions of identity and, uh, you know, who is what, and stuff getting splintered, even in a child's imagination. But this idea of just a different language is so important. Um, I was wondering, uh, how you, do you go to Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. And what is your uh, feeling when you are there? Do you feel Hungarian or do you feel more American? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, obviously I can't feel fully, I can't feel Hungarian Hungarian because I don't speak Hungarian and that is, uh, as everyone here knows, so much part of the national identity. But at the same time, um, it's hard to feel completely American when your last name is Seged Masak and you, and I have friends there, and I'm able to move around the place with a, a sense of familiarity that is perhaps more intuitive than, than learned. So it's, again, it's that funny position, but I do love going there, just return from the right I'm asking you because I also have it in the book, and Louise knows about it. Um, but it's more um, about my own struggle, because uh, when I came to America, I mean, we left in 44 overnight. Wow. And um, we were in several countries, and I'm not Jewish, but the only connection I have with Jewishness is that my father's best friend was married to a Jewish lady. I don't know how they got married, but they did. And her name was Livia, and so they named me Livia. And I just, uh, I named my daughter Livia, and also uh, her daughter is now Alexander Livia. But I, I just found out the last name because they disappeared. Her husband was not Jewish, she was Jewish. And they disappeared in December, I think, in 44. And uh, we didn't know what happened. <clears throat> but I now know, know that her name, the name was Marto, uh, Olivia. So I was very happy I just learned this, basically. So. But that is exactly what you know, I began with, is that really everywhere here, there are these remarkable stories. And well, I they don't just have to be set during that terrible time, but many are. My book, by the way, is East West Odyssey. It's a great title. Underneath some of the paintings, 
um, purchased in 1945. Now, one would be uh, hard pressed to imagine anybody buying art in Hungary in 1945. So that is an area where some activity is going on. Much uh, of it, I think, supported by Lauder, who is taking the lead in trying to get a lot of this art to be treated. But we, there isn't um, anything that my mother's family wanted that they didn't already have, which was each other in their lives. Thank you all so very much. Oh, Basel, I'm sorry. <coughs> my host that I'm not saying. Maybe. <coughs> Maybe I would like to say one question to you. First, to say that uh, you characterize yourself as a mongrel, which I think is quite the opposite. You're the perfect medium. I don't mean to be didactic about this, but the, how much more Hungarian could you be on your, on, on your father's side? How much more Jewish on your mother's side? How much a better medium could you possibly be than you did in your book, which is it's a masterful one? Uh, Creation. I rarely read a book so quickly as I did yours from cover to cover, even well, before it was published. But I, ha I do have a question. <clears throat> I knew your father quite well. I had very high respect for him. He was a remarkably uh, intelligent, very good advisor uh, on issues that were very complex. This is back in the 70s when I had the opportunity to meet him along with. Uh, with the circle of friends he had in, in, yeah. uh, in Washington, mm -hmm. Fedetz Nord, the former prime minister, and, and some others. And uh, uh, I never dreamt that he actually was in Dachau. He never said, he never said a word of yeah. that. I just wonder if, if he ever knew that when you were a child. Did he ever oh. talk about any of that? No, I mean, he never. Um you know, the, the status of survivor was something that he and nobody in the family ever appropriated because that was really for the people who were in Auschwitz. It was those who were for the people who had tattoos, who faced extermination in ways that my mother and father's family didn't. I mean, I would have thought in some ways they qualified, but they never did. And so he never really, I remember once uh, driving home from a family vacation when I was really little, he would just, he described that a little bit. And he'd also described having met Hitler several times. And that to have, to imagine that that was in his memory, the way that, you know, the Beatles coming to America and uh, high school dramas were in mind, you know, to sort of show the distance that existed between us. But one of the things that was um, interesting about what he said about meeting Hitler and about Hitler in close quarters was not just that he was a voracious vegetarian, which always seems um, odd and ironic, but also that he had this great capacity to create conflicts among the people closest to him in small groups. And that struck me, you know, that was a very much of the kind of observation my father was especially gifted at, as you know. You know, he could, he could zero in on, on a small but very telling incident and see it as being very revealing. But as, um, you know, someone who, he distanced himself from his own experience by history and by the history of others, less his own. Yes. I have one last question. Um, I, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, about the title of your book. Now, when I first read it, uh, I figured it's a translation from Hungarian. Uh, but how did you come up with the title? That was, um, well, as all of you know, it is a Hungarian expression, but it was also the way that my father would sign off his letters to my mother. And here are some of the perils of working in translation, because my translator, uh, the way that she put it was, your hands are many times kissed, which all of you who know what kiss problem is not right. But the working title was that passive voice until finally I came to my senses and realized that this was 
you know, not the best way to go. But it was the way that he would sign off his letters, and it seemed a kind of a, a multi-layered thing, because it was not just a love story, it was uh, geopolitical relationships that became uh, hand-kissing, and it was also a kind of the nature of the way these families related to each other, which was loving. And that was um, something I, I hoped also to capture a bit in the title. Are we done? Thank you all again. Contribution that she's made, she made to, to understanding uh, some very confusing events. And, uh, thank you very much for being here. And just I want to remind you that there are books still available, so she, and she's uh, she can be with us for uh, a little while to sign some books. Thank you for coming. Thank you.